coming up. But how many jobs would be threatened uh, if well, if uh, steel is continually dumped? If we uh, don't have these EV uh, the tariffs in place on aluminum, steel, and EVs, what? How many of those jobs will be threatened? You had mentioned you were having discussions with parties about your concerns of the carbon tax ramping up in the coming years and uh, the impact on the Canadian steel industry. So uh, specifically, I mean, what is the union specifically asking for? Hey, my colleague uh, across the, uh, the table here, uh, Mr. Sidhu, uh, his, his comments were that uh, you mentioned Conservatives want to remove the, the carbon tax. Uh, you bet we do want to remove the carbon tax. The world order is changing, uh, which started uh, before COVID. Uh, now it has since then accelerated. This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. The committee is commencing its study on protecting certain Canadian manufacturing sectors, including electric vehicles, aluminum and steel, against related Chinese imports and measures. You know, we, we really talk about the need for balance, balanced trade, and looking at this relationship with China, but also the, with, the, with the Americans. And Mr. Herman, I'll start with you. Uh, you finished it. Can you just let the committee know just a, a little bit about the current relationship with the U.S. and the Canadians when it comes to trade? And specifically, if you can speak about... Uh, the recent almost doubling of softwood lumber tariffs and the digital sales tax and what they're bringing up as concerns on that. Oh, those are good questions. Um, look, in a major trading relationship like the one we have with the Americans, there will always be disputes and disagreements and softwood lumber is one of, one of those. It's just a fact of life that the U.S. industry is well organized, deep pocketed, and they can keep this dispute going as long as uh, as long as they want. The only way to deal with softwood lumber is to have a separate agreement with the Americans uh, settling uh, settling uh, this matter. Uh, there will always be these kinds of differences. The point I make is that in the large scheme of things, it is important for Canada, Mexico, and the United States to work together to deal with major international concerns such as the Chinese aggressive trade actions. So um, as part of a, a, a trilateral a trade agreement, one of the largest, if not the largest uh, trade relationship in the world, uh, we should work together with our trading partners. And uh, look, to be frank, I don't think it's a it's a secret. Everybody on the committee will know this. Uh, our trade with the United States is our dominant interest when it comes to international trade. And so we have to work closely with them, notwithstanding, uh, Mr. Williams, notwithstanding the differences we might have in discrete uh, separate subject areas. And, and just from your expertise right now, is that relationship better or worse, given the fact that, yes, software lumber is going for a while, but we just doubled the tariffs and they're bringing up issues that are affecting trade, and this, they're talking about the digital sales tax is affecting a trading relationship. Is that making that relationship worse? <laughs> is it making it worse? Uh, look, there'll always be tensions in certain areas. We have an agreement, and the agreement provides for the resolution of those disputes through a third-party settlement process. We'll have to work that out. The Americans okay. will... Thank you. Thank I, you so much, sir. I only have so much time. Mr. Warren... Uh, we talked about uh, the steel industry and aluminum. You talked about a broader sense of 600,000 workers. How many workers are just in the steel industry, uh, directly or indirectly? Uh, Meg might help me with that uh, answer, but uh, directly in the steel industry for our union alone, probably close to 20,000. And um, let's talk in our members, our, our, our locations. Um, and then obviously the downstream, all the shops around it to support it, the maintenance work. So you're, you're talking 100,000 jobs or more. So 100,000 jobs, good paychecks in Canada and these industries. Um, we talk about obviously the, the EV and, and, and our, the, the steel and aluminum industries from China. And you did talk about dumping uh, of those industries and how that was going to affect it. You had a large number. Maybe you, can, you talked about 19 to 38%. But how many jobs would be threatened uh, if well, if uh, steel is continually dumped, if we uh, don't have these EV uh, the tariffs in place on aluminum, and steel, and EVs? What? How many of those jobs would be threatened? Of those, uh, uh, I, I would I would suggest to you if we don't figure it out, 
every job will be under uh, will be under threat the uh because it comes down to investment and if again you can't sell your steel there's no premium on green steel right now even though we produce some of the greenest steel in the world there's no premium in in the marketplace for for green steel so if we don't um put in tariffs to help these manufacturers so they invest um what's a nation without a steel industry what about all the good jobs the communities they create and i will tell you the last point i'll make is if we're not able to stop our, our porous borders um with foreign steel being dumped in because at the end of the day it leaks into the us and our greatest trade partner especially with steel is the us and uh, i assume their patience are running thin if we cannot um kind of look after our borders and foreign steel continues to leak into their into their uh into their uh country very very concerned about that thank you sir and and something else that we've been hearing from some of the producers as well as is which is affecting this is also the carbon tax is the carbon tax going to increase the cost for the steel industry and if so how many jobs would be in threat under that well, right now, I think it's too early to say how many jobs. I think uh, from my perspective, there is no doubt about it that uh, steel producers should not be uh, off, let scot-free around creating the green economy or continue to grow within the green economy. I am somewhat concerned how it ramps up um, in the, with the steel industry. So we're having a harder look at that right now. And we're trying to see if they need a bit of a carve out, a bit of a runway, so the technology can catch up with them. The investments can come and catch up with our steel industry. But it's clear to say they shouldn't be let off the hook. But I am concerned right now the way it ramps up, if it is um, that we need a closer look at it to see how it impacts investment. And are you asking then for a pause? Is that something you're asking for? Uh, no, not not directly. Um, what uh, we were reaching out to some of the parties to have the discussion. I was with the steel producers a couple months ago. We talked to all three parties about it, made them aware of it. And again, um, we're hopeful that as we continue down this path to figure out a solution that works for our environment, our children, our Thank grandchildren. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. We're 20, 20 seconds over. Exploring carbon adjustment. Could you please uh, delve into that a little further, what a carbon adjustment would do in, in potentially protecting steelworker, aluminum jobs, EV jobs, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the, the theory behind a car, carbon border adjust, adjustment is when steel does come to our shores and it's made in a way that isn't meet our, our standards or in a, creates environmental impact, uh, creates a problem with uh, carbon emissions, that for them to enter our border to be purchased, there's a carbon border adjustment. You're not doing what it takes to change the world for our kids and grandkids. And we can no longer just let your your steel into our country, your product into our country, if it's not made up to our standards, because all as you do at that point is undercut all the good work the steel manufacturers are doing in Canada and the U.S. And um, you make them not want to invest. And the minute you don't get investment in these huge operations, you're like a grape dying on the vine. So, um, yeah, it is a next step, an important step. I was going to ask the CLC about uh, how important the prevailing wages and union wages are for the tax credits, if you could answer that in a very short time. It's extremely important to create good jobs in the transition to a green economy, without a doubt. I guess what a lot of Canadians, and certainly myself, uh, are concerned about is how this will affect the necessary fight to reduce our emissions overall and promote the uptake of electric vehicles uh, in Canada and promote you know the electric vehicle industry I think and I'm going to turn to Ms. Kwan uh, the CLC and and talk about I think you if I'm not mistaken made the point that these should be short-term temporary measures to make sure that Canadian manufacturers step up to the plate and start producing uh, low-cost vehicles that Canadians can afford and if they're so afraid of Chinese uh, vehicles coming in that are cheaper than ours um, this is what we should be striving for and this is what we should be using 
these tariffs uh, to drive. Is that, is that the point you were trying to make? Yes, that is exactly, exactly the point. This is uh, basically a, a short reprieve, a temporary reprieve for Canadian uh, e manufacturers in the EV supply chain to basically step up to the plate and you know build the things that they have promised to build with investments from a lot of uh, public dollars, right? And and to actually get it started. The issue is that. We haven't really established or used the the amount of investments to actually establish um, a, a solid foundation yet, and so the introduction of uh, cheap EVs at this point will be very very damaging. What we're saying is that Canadians are competitive, and therefore we need to give ourselves a chance uh, to actually build on the investments. And you know this, um, the uh, tariffs or the surtaxes are really uh, a stopgap uh, approach to give everyone a chance to get things going. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'll turn to Mr. Breton and ask more or less the same question. Uh, I think you brought up a lot of those points. I know I was, my wife and I were looking at EVs this summer in lots in British Columbia. There are plenty available there. A lot of them are fairly expensive. But I think British Columbia is ahead of other, many other provinces because we have a provincial government that is supporting that uh, shift to EVs with EV infrastructure, uh, EV uh, subsidies for purchase. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on, on that same question and, and perhaps add what vehicles we are making in Canada now or planning to make uh, in the low-cost EV bracket or are we uh, ignoring that bracket altogether? Actually we are. Uh, so that is an issue and, uh, and, and to tell you the truth, uh, you know, there was plans to build, you know, an electric pickup truck in Ontario and uh, Ford decided to postpone their plans to build an electric pickup truck and go with a gas pickup truck. Um, and uh, one thing that I found really uh, quite stunning, actually, uh, is that uh, now there's a Dodge Charger EV being assembled in uh, Windsor, Ontario, uh, because there is regulation for EV sales in BC and Quebec, even though Ontario taxpayers are subsidizing the assembly of those cars in Ontario. They won't be able to have access to those cars. Only people in BC and Quebec will have access to those cars. And that shows you the, the power of regulation. So uh, it is an issue. My, car makers like uh, Hyundai, Kia, VW, Ford, GM, VinFast, Tesla, and others are talking about uh, making more affordable electric cars between now and 2027. We just want to make sure that we have access to those cars in Canada because right now, as I said in my opening statement, car makers are not even making affordable gas cars. I mean, they're not providing them to Canadians anymore. So it is a big issue of affordability, even for gas vehicles. So we want to make sure that uh, we support our workers and our workers start making more affordable gas and electric cars, but specifically electric cars in Canada with the funding that we're giving car makers and suppliers. So you're suggesting that a, the three-year relief period should be used and regulation should be in place to make sure that the cars that are being produced in Canada do reflect that need for lower cost EVs so that we can, you know, the, re the whole reason we're pushing to get EVs built is to bring down our emissions and we can't do that yes. if people can't afford them. Exactly. So obviously, you know, right now the price of EVs is getting more and more competitive with the price of gas cars. And if you look at, you know, mid-market, they are very competitive now. But when you're looking at entry-level EVs, um, there's a gap. I mean, actually, it was easier to buy an entry-level EV three, four, five years ago than it is now because there was more choice then than there is now. Now most car manufacturers are offering SUVs, pickup trucks that are more expensive. So if my wife was to scrap her small electric car, she couldn't find anything or hardly anything.
Yeah, I just want to follow up with Mr. Warren. And uh, you had mentioned in your discussions the United Steel Workers represent about 225,000 members in the steel, aluminum, and mining sector. Workers, and you had mentioned the workers are the backbone to Canada's EV supply chain. Um, I just want to follow up on my colleague's line of questioning earlier. You had mentioned you were having discussions with parties about your concerns of the carbon tax ramping up in the coming years and uh, the impact on the Canadian steel industry. So uh, specifically, I mean, what is the union specifically asking for? You had mentioned a carve out in your, your, your opening comments. So who are you speaking to? And I mean, how, what have you requested from this government and what has been their response? Yeah, well, it's a, it's been jointly with the steel producers, and if um, you, you listen to the steel producers, they raise a lot of issues. I don't know, they raise issues about just investment, the technology, the further technology they need to have to get where they need to go. I think every steel producer that we're with um, wants to be a green steel producer, but again, it's the attraction of investment. And if it's uncertain grounds, there's there's a concern about investment. So I would say that it's best I could say it's a work in progress. I think every party, uh, all three parties that we did not, or I did not visit the block that day. My apologies. There was uh, the NDP who came late later, was the Conservatives and Liberals. And I think they all understood that how important a a uh, steel industry is to call yourself a nation aluminum industry and i think it's going to take further discussions obviously we're doing a lot of work the sue around uh, electric arc furnaces so that's going to be helpful but again i think it's an open dialogue i don't think you can say the current plan won't work but we're just now kind of raising some flags to say hey sometimes one one shoe doesn't fit all, and the steel industry might need a longer ramp up or or some other things. Um, but I think it's important to say that we all agree, steel producers and ourselves, that producing green steel. Well, are, well, to your point, Mr. Warren, and I, I think it is important that we have these discussions. That, you know, we don't operate in isolation, particularly when it comes to other issues and policies impacting the, the sector. And specifically, I mean, in, back in November of 2022, Ms. Gingrich appeared here when we were doing a study of the Inflation Reduction Act. And during her testimony, she did say this, we do have some concerns that the IRA's incentive for firms to invest in clean technology, absent any carbon tax, provide a double advantage to U.S. steel producers. Uh, she also testified later on, I think the combination of the lack of a price on carbon in the United States and the provisions of the IRA could put the Canadian steel industry at a disadvantage, including our members. So it seems this government, uh, if steel workers aren't being undermined by the Liberals on carbon tax at home, they're being undermined by the Liberals letting artificially cheap Chinese-made EV, steel, and aluminum into Canada. And for many years, they've been undermined, uh, undermining Canada on both. So do you agree? And um, what are your comments on this? Well, I guess my initial comments would be that there's been two different approaches. In the U.S., um, it's been kind of a carrot approach where with the amount of monies and different pots of monies they're offering up to incentivize a big industry to go green is that approach. And, you know, the steel producers and other producers would say Canada is using more of a stick approach, you know, fall in line or else the costs go up each year up until 2030. So again, I don't think I'm ready to throw the baby out with the bath water. But I do believe that it's uh, an issue that we'll continue to discuss to find out what's right, to find out how it works. Because I, I do want to say this, and it might be out of the wrong spot, but it's so important for every one of us on this call, for our kids and our grandkids. This is a chance to belong to a new economy. Quite frankly, we lost... Yeah, but Mr. Warren, if I could, what does that stick approach that this federal government has decided to take, what does the risk to those 225,000 members. The the risk What does it mean for Stelco for yeah, example yeah. in Hampton, no, the, which was recently purchased yeah. by the United by a firm in the United States. What yeah, is that I, stick approach and the cost in terms of carbon? What does that mean to those Canadian workers that live in Hamilton? What does that mean for them? The risk uh, you the have risk 10 seconds sir yeah. for an answer. Either I don't think you can get an answer in in that particular time. 
Okay. I will go on to Mr. Sidhu, please. The EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, also known as CBAM, is EU's tool to put a fair price on the carbon emitted during the production of carbon intensive goods that are entering the EU and to encourage cleaner industrial production in non EU countries. By confirming that a price has been paid for the embedded carbon emissions generated in the production of certain goods imported into the EU, the CBAM will ensure the carbon price of imports is equivalent to the carbon price of domestic production and that the EU's climate objectives are not undermined. CBAM will ensure the carbon price of imports is equivalent to the carbon price of domestic production and the EU's, again, climate objectives are not in undermined. So if the Conservatives are talking about removing uh, carbon pricing, we know that our exports and industries the EU composes of a large market, close to half a billion consumers. And Ms. Kwan, the Canadian Labour Congress represents many of these industries that ship to the EU. And so if we remove carbon pricing in Canada and we don't have environmental progressive policies in place, no doubt we will be hit with, with uh, import taxes in the EU, which will unfairly target our industries and workers here in Canada. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you for your question. Um, I think that uh, the um, Canada's work on the carbon border adjustment uh, front has been a little slow, <laughs> and we need to do better on it. Um, my understanding is, and we have a lot to learn from the EU, is uh, that the way that we have been talking about the CBA in Canada is not compatible with how it's not integrated in a way that it would fit in with CBAM. But that doesn't mean that it's not working. That just means that we have to work harder to find ways of actually making the two systems work together. And you're right. With, if, if we don't meet some of the basic standards of the EU, or the US for that matter, um, we will be at a loss. We'll be, Canada will be penalized and jobs will be lost or, you know, uh, manufacturing decrease because of that. So one way or another, in order to actually build a sustainable, resilient, um, green economy, we have to really take a long view and really invest in not just you know the the EV supply chain, but invest in a lot of other things. You know, for instance, we have to invest in uh, electrification, in charging infrastructure. Uh, we have to invest in um, a lot of um, uh, technology as well. You know, we we cannot just say that this particular response to the Chinese EV is the end point. It is not. This is, in fact, a very, well, I would say pre-starting point. We need to really, uh, all of us, work really hard to make sure that, you know, we have a very long-term view and long-term investments by government, by, by manufacturers, by Canadians, by workers, to actually build a future uh, for what, you know, Mr. Warren said, for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Kwan, for that. And uh, I'd like to turn to, to Mr. Warren now as well. Um, as, as we heard from Ms. Kwan today, that is why we stepped up with tariffs on imports from the Chinese EV sector, because we want to make sure we protect industry and workers to make sure that we're all playing on a level playing field. And so, Mr. Warren, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on CBAM and how if we, you know, roll back our supports to the environment and our progressive policies, how that could impact uh, exports to the, the European Union market and, and what we're doing here in Canada. And I think I'd start by saying, and probably equating what was just said, it can't be just a, a one-thing approach, whether it be melt and pour, whether it be strong enforcement at the border, whether it be the trade hearings, hearing from workers, whether it be these tariffs that we're talking about today. First thing I would say is our economy, our we, we're not a communist country. It takes our time a while that it's a, a democratic country and we've got to convince consumers. We've got to do stuff. We just can't say, hey, as of tomorrow, here you go. Um, so I think that is give, giving us some breathing time, allowing our companies, whether they be in steel manufacturing or anything, to get set up and to get uh, more prepared. Because I will tell you that when we went to the global economy in manufacturing, we lost. Our kids lost. Canada lost, what, 1.5 million jobs in, what, a year and a half, three years. The U.S. lost millions upon millions of jobs. And we can't have that again. 
what was the cost of the fifty dollar VCR? I can tell you, wiped out every uh, Zenith manufacturer and Canadian manufacturer. And what we're trying to do with this, we'll, uh, whatever element you want to pick, is to build it for the future, build an economy, take back Thank our economy. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry I have children. to cut you off. Uh, just wanting to quickly, um, I, my colleague uh, across the uh, the table here, uh, Mr. Sidhu, uh, his his comments were that uh, he mentioned conservatives want to remove the the carbon tax. Uh, you bet we do want to remove the carbon tax. Uh, glad that uh, Mr. Sidhu has uh, finally uh, uh, come on board and hearing the message uh, to that. Um, but I would I would stress to him that it's not just conservatives that want to remove the carbon tax. There's premiers across the country now. Even in in uh, Mr. Canning's home province of BC, uh, he's moving away from the the carbon tax. This is what Canadians are asking for. At the, at the end of the day, the carbon tax is driving up the cost of groceries, home heating, and, and getting goods to to market. So to to uh, just want to make sure that Mr. Sidhu knows that. It's not just us that's asking for this. We're reflecting the, the thoughts of Canadians from across the country. Uh, might to just end, uh, share a little bit of my time with my, my uh, new colleague to the committee, uh, Mr. Williams, at the end, but want to quickly ask um, Mr. Herman uh, a, a brief uh, uh, question. You mentioned as part of your, uh, your opening comments about the softwood lumber always kind of being an, an issue. Uh, the fact is it uh, wasn't uh, uh, as big of an issue today as it was under the the uh, Stephen Harper uh, Conservative government. And it wasn't until the agreement ended in, in October of 2015 that all that this government has been able to do is, sec is secure a moratorium for the, uh, the the software lumber agreement. So I, I I would like to ask you, Mr. Herman, if, if you see this as, as, a, as a bigger issue in terms of the relationship between the the current government and the uh, the government down in the United States, uh, coupling this with the digital sales tax uh, as well that's uh, come into force. Is this uh, uh, are these issues that will uh, cause friction to that relationship? Well, frankly, I don't think the softwood lumber issue uh, is uh, something that would destabilize our relationship with the United States. Um, I had said earlier that it is a an irritant, it is a problem, uh, and it can only be resolved, in my view, through a separate agreement between Canada and the United States to deal with these issues. But I don't see softwood lumber uh, as a destabilizing element in our relationship. It is one of uh, a series of difficulties we have with our major trading partner. So uh, I would hope that uh, both sides could come to uh, some agreement on settling this, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's about the U.S. industry wanting to protect its market share. And as long as they have the money to pay lawyer, case will destabilize our, our good relationship, generally speaking, with, with the Americans. One remaining, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee. Ms. Kwan, um, we talk about uh, union, union members and good workers in Canada. We want to protect those jobs. Uh, we're talking about the mining sector. So right now this committee is, is debating tariffs on China. This government right now has not chosen to put tariffs on, on critical minerals from China. But 70% 70, 70 of cobalt and lithium is mined and refined and bought from Canada here, so it's not, those aren't union jobs in Canada, those are in China. 90% of rare minerals that provide batteries and mag magnets for batteries, they're mined in China and brought here. Uh, what Can you tell me about the labor standards here in Canada versus China and why those jobs should be protected, those mining jobs here in Canada, those union, unionized mining jobs? Thank you for your question. I, I'm not really that clear about what you're asking about, but definitely we have higher labor standards. In fact, because we have higher labor standards, we are attractive to the EU, we are attractive to the US, and I think that that's very valuable to our trading relationships with uh, the US and the EU. In terms of, um, you know, the if you want to talk about labor standards, uh, much of the, I believe, the extraction as well as the production of um, uh, critical minerals for 
EV batteries are actually made in Xinjiang, which you know very well is made, uh, is, is where a lot of forced labor is used. So, you know, uh, if I, I have, you know, absolutely no, no desire for our standards to get to those standards uh, in, in terms of our future in, in the green economy. Uh, on the bigger picture, uh, Madam Chair, uh, the world order is changing, uh, which started uh, before COVID. Uh, now it has since then accelerated. Uh, globalization, as we know, is dead. Uh, so is almost the free trade. The free trade, which benefited uh, both uh, developing countries and developed countries, uh, is on its way out. Uh, productionism is in. We are focusing on onshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, uh, and obviously we all want to protect our, our domestic industries. Uh, where it will lead to, what impacts it will have, it will be known uh, after quite some time. But immediate impact would be uh, whatever the policies uh, to protect our industries we take will also have a uh, immediate effect on our other sectors within Canada, which are export dependent. Uh, Canadian agriculture sector have made Canadian agri-foods and uh, agriculture produce expose. They have made Canada the fifth largest in the world. And uh, it is that sector I think is going to get first impacted by the decision that we have made. Probably the canola growers will be the first uh, uh, group of farmers who are going to get uh, affected. However, uh, this is a reality. Uh, United States is our biggest trading partner. Our economic uh, prosperity is linked and dependent on our trade with the United States. And uh, once the United States took the decision uh, to impose tariffs on uh, EVs from China, the, we had uh, in, it was inevitable that we follow suit. As uh, Global Mail editorial uh, recently wrote, uh, matching uh, American tariffs uh, would be the right decision, even though that such tariffs are usually bad. As I said, uh, this is a new paradigm. Uh, we don't know where it leads to. And it does not affect only Canada. It affects uh, uh, all the countries in the world, especially the developed countries in the world who were the champions of the free trade. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Herman, i got a question for you. Uh, I did uh, read your article in Globe and Mail on this issue, uh, and I also listened to your comments today. I think uh, you, I don't know if you are 100% uh, confident that uh, the route we took uh, using Section 53 of the Customs Tariff Act uh, to do this is the right one. Uh, obviously, taking this route means that uh, we are losing the WTO cover uh, where uh, which we could have used to show reaffirm our commitment to multilateral rules based order uh, in that article you do propose that we can provide two uh, uh, two arguments i think uh, one of that arguments would have necessitated what you just proposed today that uh, we amend the section 53 of the custom tariff act uh, by including reference to national security uh, Obviously, the decision that we have taken may not uh, go to the court uh, to face the challenges. So the intricacies of uh, what route we took, what uh, why we didn't go through the WTO route or uh, the route we took may not get challenged. But uh, I just want to ask you again, uh, are you confident uh, that uh, the route we have taken using Section 53 uh, is the right one? Uh I am confident that it is the right route that we have taken in this case. Uh, look, uh, the uh, world uh, uh, multilateral trading order uh, is under tremendous stress. I, I think we've reached a point where uh, it doesn't answer all of the challenges that countries uh, face. Uh, and in this case, uh, Canada uh, took steps, and I think those steps are, in my view, consistent with the right of governments, members of the WTO, to 
take exceptional measures to protect national security. We don't get, need to get into all the intricate legal arguments, but I think we did the right thing. And we have to recognize that some of the rules of the multilateral order, which were drafted many, many decades ago, uh, need to be adjusted and uh, need to take into account uh, the uh, contemporary trading environment. And so uh, we did the right thing. Uh, I think that, uh, as I said before, we're part of a, a trade agreement with the United States and Mexico. I think we need to uh, consolidate our operations as best we can and coordinate with our major trading partners. So from a legal and policy point of view, um, my conclusion is that the Section 53 tariffs w were the right move uh, in this case. Thank you very much, Mr. Herman. All right, that completes the um, two rounds. Thank <laughs> you.